Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground. I'm Anya, the events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for, a com for the first installment of our series, Looking After Conversations in Art and Healing, featuring Shriya Chatterjee, James Clar, Guadalupe Maravilla, Stephanie Misa, Suzanne Hudson, and Tanya Sheehan. We're thrilled to welcome poet Tess Taylor here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on the Napa Hooking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living doc document of resources and actions, which I will post shortly. And now to introduce today's guests and hosts. Art historian and environmental humanities scholar, Shriya Chatterjee is the founder and project lead of the Visualizing the Virus Digital Project and is head of research and learning at the Paul Mellon Center for Studies in British Art in London. Guadalupe Maravilla is a transdisciplinary visual artist, choreographer and healer. Maravilla grounds his practice in the historical and contemporary context belonging to undocumented communities and the cancer community. Maravilla has been exhibited in major museums such as the Whitney Museum of, of American Art and the Museum of Modern Art and is a 2019 recipient of the Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. James Clark was born in Wisconsin to immigrant Filipino parents. He studied film and animation at NYU and received his master's from NYU's interactive telecommunications program. Having worked from Dubai, Tokyo, and New York, he most recently moved to studio back to his native Philippines. And Stephanie Misa lives in Vienna, Austria, and is currently a lecturer at the Artistic Strategies Department of the University of Applied Arts, Vienna. Her recent works include the Ninth Buc Bucharest Biennale and an upcoming group show at the Kunstlerhaus Vienna. She will be an RMIT Intersect Residency Fellow in summer of 2022. And our hosts, art historian and critic Suzanne Hudson, is Associate Professor of Art History and Fine Arts at the University of Southern California in Los Angeles. She is currently at work on Better for the Making Art Therapy Process, a study of the therapeutic origins of art making within American modernism. And Tanya Sheehan is William R. Keenan Jr. Professor of Art at Colby College and Principal Investigator of Colby's Public Humanistic Inquiry Lab, focus on the intersections of medicine and race. And we'd like to also thank Colby and USC uh, for sponsoring this program. So without further ado, please uh, take it away. Thank you so much, Anya. And I'll just reiterate the thanks to our sponsors, as it were, to Colby and USC and to you, Anya, and everyone at the Brooklyn Rail for all of your amazing help in bringing this to gather today um, and to the people here for the conversation, the speakers and also everyone else who I hope will um, be compelled to um, join our conversation um, in, in a few minutes time. So what we're going to do today is I'm just going to briefly kind of introduce myself a little bit more and Tanya will do the same and introduce the series of which this is the first program. And then we will turn it over to um, presentations and open it, therefore, after to conversations. So um, just a little bit of background. Um, Anya mentioned the book I'm working on, but it's more broadly part of a question that really has animated a lot of my interest in research for the last few years about modernist art making and kind of extra aesthetic spaces. So I became really interested in thinking about how and why art got annexed in um, settlement houses, but also prisons and clinics and spaces of psychological and occupational therapy. So I started thinking a lot more about kind of questions of what art does under various kinds of circumstances more so than, than what it is. Um, but my research interests, as I say, are, are more around questions of art therapy, um, but this has led to Tanya and my conversation around these topics and maybe I'll throw it over to you for just a minute. Thanks, Suzanne. Um, and thanks to everyone who made this program possible. Uh, my own interest in the subject of art and healing uh, stems from my scholarship on the visual culture of medicine. 
That work has ranged from my 2011 book titled Doctored, The Medicine of Photography in 19th Century America, um, to my current book project on 20th century African-American artists' engagement with medicine and public health. That work has explored how medical practices make ideas about race visible or invisible and themselves participate in the work of race making. Alongside many of today's panelists, I ask how images expose or conceal racial bias in diagnosis and treatment, um, racial disparities in access to care, and the exploitation of race subjects in biomedical research. Suzanne is going to talk a little bit more now about this series of conversations. Yeah, so we're so happy to be here together. Um, we, as I say, kind of got together around these, these shared research interests and have developed over the course of, I guess, about the last year and a half, I guess, or maybe even two years, um, actually kind of coinciding with uh, the pandemic, um, but just accidentally. But we've been engaged in a research group around questions of art and medicine, um, medical humanities, critical medical humanities, very broadly defined. And we were thinking a lot about um, how capacious these terms actually are, kind of what is art, what is healing, what is the opposition of one to the, the other historically, as well as in this moment where we need to so fundamentally rethink art and its institutions. Um, so we developed this series and this is the first one we wanted it to be um, in some ways um, the most intersected with this moment in which we find ourselves where in fact we're not really looking after although we're imagining maybe some forms of futurity such as they are. Um, but we meant the title also very much in the sense of care and caregiving and thinking about the kind of possibilities um, that are emergent in this time as well about what does it mean or what might it mean to look after each other and what might art have to do with this. And in exploring the relations between art and healing um, in this series, we have a number of goals. Uh, they are to share diverse perspectives across the global visual arts community, uh, to showcase new voices and specifically emerging projects, and to communicate across multiple audiences and disciplines. We have a number of big questions that are guiding the series. Um, at the center would be how we define notions of art and notions of healing. Um, how does art represent or construct ideas about health, healing, and care or care work? And in what spaces can that work happen and for whom does it happen? So with that, we want to welcome you to this first one today and again, um, just extend our deep gratitude um, for our speakers and I'll turn it over to Sria right away whose work, as you'll see, is um, directly um, imbricated in this moment, and I think thinking about it so productively. So thank you all in advance for sharing what you've been up to um, in this um, really strange time, and we'll look forward to talking about it all um, in, in a little bit. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much, Suzanne and Tanya, and for, to the Brooklyn Rail for having me uh, on here today. Um, I'm, I'm really, I'm as excited to be here as I am to actually to hear everybody else and to see, see their work. So I'm very much looking forward uh, to, to this session. Um, well, just kind of as a very quick background, um, I'm an art historian and I've been working with uh, questions around history of science. But, and um, in a sense, I'm interested in both the social ramifications, social and political ramifications really of both art and science. And um, one of the things that I wanted to share with you today is um, a, a digital project that I've been working on um, since late 2020. And it's a, it's really kind of a, a multi, like collaborative multi-authored project. And I, I also wanna give a shout out to Ellen Ambrosone, who's based at Princeton, has been working uh, on the project um, as well from relatively early on. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and do a kind of walkthrough of the project so we can sort of just look together uh, in a sense. So tell me if or how this is working. Just a second. Everybody see my screen? Um, looks good. Yeah. Okay. Great, so this is just a, um, the homepage of, for visualizing the virus. And uh, I'll just scroll down so you get a sense of 
what it looks like, and then we can talk a little bit about what it does and so on. So the, the idea behind the project was really to think about um, you know, how we represent something as invisible as um, the SARS-CoV-2 virus and what, what that means in very different um, respects. But also, and I, I think as importantly, um, to think about all the, the different kinds of um, inequalities that um, the pandemic makes visible. So in a sense, we're thinking about, um, as uh, Tanya already talked about, um, things like racial disparities, gender inequalities, access to care, sort of failures of infrastructure, state, and so on. So uh, in a sense, the hope is to really think about and understand and see the pandemic from a very, from a variety of different perspectives. And um, uh, in a sense, also this question of how we see and what is visible is really at the heart of um, what we're trying to do here. Um, and uh, so I think just to go back to one, um, the introduction that Suzanne and Tanya gave us earlier to think about what the definitions of art and healing are. And I think uh, what, how visualizing the virus also comes to them uh, is that like, this is, so there's a lot of artists who are in this, uh, in the project, there's a lot of art historians who write about visual things, but there are a lot of scientists as well, sort of uh, epidemiologists, anthropologists, we have um, people working on sort of politics, um, history. So it's a very like mixed group of people who are thinking about what it means to see and how we see and what we see. Uh, but at the same time, it is in a sense also a kind of like multi-authored um, art project installation in itself. Um, but the, this idea of art being how we understand the world and how we see the world and we, how we make sense of the world, I think is quite crucial and how it connects with really just sort of everyday lived experience as well as like in a sense what we do with it. Um, so I think I wanna show you a little, like take you into the website as we talk about how, um, how healing comes into it as well. Because um, one of the ways that uh, I have been thinking from the start about why we need to see things all together uh, is, um, is that like visualizing in some sense is a revolutionary act in, in the fact that it makes it makes you able to understand what 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 is out there. So the the digital kind of architecture of this project is to be able to showcase a variety of different perspectives and make the connections that you wouldn't otherwise have made. So I'll, I'll tell you what I mean by that in a second. Um, so for instance, if you go into the website, you'll see that there's um, we have curated clusters. Um, and something that's called themed clusters, as well as a bunch of sort of individual contributions. And um, the curated clusters often are done by sort of external curators and they focus on something quite specific. So for example, this is, um, this one, it talks about visualizing COVID-19 as a zoonotic disease. So let's enter um, the cluster and as curated by um, Christos Linteris, who's a who's an anthropologist. And so every curated cluster, which is quite specific, has an introduction by the cluster curator and all of these sort of individual pieces. And once you enter an individual piece, um, a lot of the pieces are texts and some of them are um, video and audio as well. But with every piece, what you see on the side are these kind of, um, portals to enter themed clusters. So for instance, if I wanted, if I clicked on animals, it takes me to very soon. Um, it takes me to the themed cluster on animals. Uh, and what you have here is a kind of a much broader approach to um, all, all the different contributions that talk about animals, or for instance, 
talk about airborne tr transmission or activism, which I think is kind of an interesting cluster to, to look at here. So you can't enter these theme clusters, but you can click on um, particular contributions and kind of open them to see where it takes you. So for instance, this is uh, something on food security and resilience um, in uh, Fiji and um, its neighboring island states. And, but, and this is something about um, experience, experiencing the pandemic as uh, a Muslim in Modi's India at the moment. Uh, and so what, what, what these clusters do is really give you a sense of the different types of activism or the different kinds of, like, so we have different types of topics uh, happening over a broad range of geography. So it's very local stories, but you're able to connect uh, at, a, at a level that allows you to look across um, geographies and topics as well sometimes. So you have art, which is quite well populated, um, but also some sort of geographical clusters, capitalism, um, care, uh, and we colonialism. So I'm not going to read, read them out one by one. Like, please kind of walk into the website and uh, experience it as well. Um, but I think, yeah, just to kind of go back to this point about um, sort of making connections and what, how that kind of empowers us as well to heal, to, to be able to care in a kind of larger um, way, um, to make sense of your own experience in relation to other people's experience, but also to kind of learn, I think, um, about just the ways in which things connect. Um, yeah, kind of gives you a sense of empowerment. So that, that's kind of the, the main hope beyond, behind the project and that it, it becomes a space that people can kind of make their own and, and participate and, um, and contribute to as well. So um, please do feel free to write to us. Um, there's a, not, not to make this kind of like salesperson-y talk, but really we're, we're always looking for, um, you know, sort of new voices and so on. So there's a uh, participate um, link in there. Um, so yeah, I'm really happy to kind of chat about it and discuss it more. Um, and I'll sort of uh, give the floor over to our next speaker so we can hear about their amazing projects as well. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. There you go. So um, Stephanie and James, should we show, should we just cue the excerpt and start with that? I think Guadalupe was next, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, my apologies. Yeah, it's okay. It doesn't matter. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Book and Rail, Suzanne, for putting this together. Um, uh, it's exciting to be here. Um, I love to share this space. I'm very um, honored to share this space with the speakers today. And I'm going to start my presentation here. I'm going to share my screen. OK, can you guys see that? OK. Um, my name is Guadalupe Maravilla. And I'm an artist, and I'm also a healer, among many other things that, I'm, that, I, that I do. Um, and everything that I do revolves around the core of, of, of my trauma, which was says uh, I was undocumented, unaccompanied child. I came here from El Salvador, uh, part of the first wave of children to come to this country, escaping violence from Central America, and it still continues today. I'm also a cancer survivor. So those are the two communities that I focus on. And obviously, uh, before the pandemic, I was really engage with these communities, but after the pandemic, it seems like everyone is really interested in talking about healing. Um, so I was doing these community circles in the Lower East Side, Manhattan, uh, for the undocumented community. I was very fortunate to get a Soros grant, and I got this space 
and I would I would invite healers of all sorts. Uh, you know, any, anyone from like a, a shaman, curandero, a witch, a pastor, uh, someone from the city of New York would come and teach us about uh, where to obtain organic, uh, affordable uh, produce. Right. Uh, I would have um, acupuncturists to my colleagist to someone doing anyone. All types of healers were invited. This will happen every two, every week, and the document um, documented community showed up. And they needed. Uh, they were really hungry for this type of knowledge to heal. Um, here is an image of a herbalist showing us the medicinal qualities of the weeds growing in the in the streets on the Lower East Side. We're making tinctures, and I would always start by playing the gongs, doing a sound healing ceremony, um, and. And you know, someone's doing exercises here, more Reiki. Um, also, I would always close out with inviting a Salvadoran chef that would talk to us about uh, pre-Hispanic cooking and nutritious uh, foods and how to like really take care of the body with nutrition. Um, again, like a lot of the stuff that I learned has to do with, with my own healing from cancer. I, he, I, I learned about healing, uh, you know, I did chemotherapy, radiation, two surgeries, but I learned from uh, healers from all over the world, from China, Tibet, Korea, Israel, Native Americans, all the Native Americans from Mexico, Central America, South America. I learned a lot about sound, how sound is, is medicine. Um, that became part of my, my work. Uh, I do all types of healing, but on the surface, sound is, is what I use most, especially when we're entering the institutions kind of working in, in communities. Um, nope. Um, so I work, I work with communities, like uh, I spend a lot of time volunteering at a church in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. Um, where I just donate a lot of my time in, in multiple ways. And I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, but so this was all happening for two years before the pandemic. But once the pandemic hit, um, the community was, uh, was suffering because they're undocumented and they couldn't work. Like the first like six to eight months was very, particularly very difficult. So they were says to me uh, asking if I can help in any way. Uh, when I got my stimulus check, I broke it into four, gave for four families put it on Instagram, and eventually people started sending me money on my Venmo, and I raised about $80,000 in a six-month period, and I was just handing cash to people. Uh, you know, people were calling me that I didn't know, telling me, Lupe, uh, I'm undocumented, uh, I'm a single mom, I can't, I don't have any money to eat. No one's helping me, and I would just, okay, what do you need? Here's the cash, no questions asked, here you go. And word got around, and I just kept going. And just kept going um and eventually it was not sustainable so i joined forces with uh juan carlos ruiz in bay ridge and he was feeding like three thousand families per week and i was doing everything from delivering food to spending some of the money that i got from the donations and bought you know uh rice beans and my seca powder which is the corn powder like about 1500 pounds of, of grains per week uh, so this kind of kept going. Um, eventually, the church became a place where I continued to do the same work I was doing before with the community. Um, I'm also like, this is an example of one of my sculptures. This is at my show, Planeta Abuelex, in, in Socrates Sculpture Park. And these are sculptures that I make that I consider them to be healing instruments. They have the gongs in them, they produce sound, and, and they, be, they become the machines that, that heal, right? They, they start the process of heal. Just to be clear here, I, I don't believe in healing anyone. I believe that everyone needs to heal themselves and I'm here to provide them in the right direction. So this, this is what I, this is my approach to healing. Uh, this is a drawing aerial view of the drawing we did. It's a mural that got blown up into a billboard for the uh, show. I was able to hire fire keepers to uh, protect the space every time we had a ceremony. Um, they also were there to receive anything that anyone was releasing, send it into the fire. Among that, I had a team of sound healers and a medicinal garden that I, I, I planted with ancestral plants from Central America. Uh, and we were able to do these sound baths. 
Uh, and in some cases, a thousand people would show up uh, or outdoors, everybody was masked. And at some point I started doing ceremonies for people with cancer or people that uh, are cancer survivors, which includes uh, someone that has survived from cancer, someone that's gone through cancer or someone that has a family member that was affected by cancer in any way, they were invited. And we will open up circles that people will go and speak about their experiences and share open mic, these kind of things. So it was a communal type of healing, um, more about the culture. And here is a little aerial view of, of the sound, one of the sound baths. So yeah, so this is uh, the collaboration of healing continues. Uh, I'm continuing to learn and grow every time I have a ceremony and we'll see how it goes from here. Thank you. That was amazing. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to pick up where uh, Guadalupe left off, uh, and we're starting with a project that James Clar and I and um, multiple spirits, uh, Mika Maruyama and my Endo, I think Mika is here with us today, actually, we all collaborated on. Um, this uh, clip of the video you're about to see was actually made in April of 2020, so fresh into the pandemic. Um, it was one of those things that we felt we had to do, actually, even in the very beginning of it. Um, the group uh, was watching the Diamond Princess, if you remember this event. Like this was before the world went into lockdown and we were kind of transfixed with this, um, with this ship that nobody wanted to, to port anywhere and ended up back in Yokohama, Japan. And um, it became this liminal space, almost like a practice space where the pandemic could play out. And what we were really interested in was actually to see um, which group then became uh, regarded as disposable. Who were the disposable people in this scenario? And it quickly became very clear that it was actually the contract workers, the service workers who were working on the cruise ship. Um, but not to give too much away since you're seeing the clip, um, yeah, I'll stop there. But James, did you want to add anything to that short intro? No, no, I think that's that's perfect. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was just kind of a, uh, we had a fascination with Diamond Princess and our relation to uh, also like the OFWs, Odyssey workers that were there. And also as this kind of like small microcosm of what was going to kind of unfold uh, globally uh, was mm -hmm. happening on the ship. Um, uh, yeah, pre like just at the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. Sorry, is there audio? Yeah, I don't know. Sorry to interrupt, James. You may have to stop your screen share. Um, oh, and then when you, you just have to enable audio. It's me. Sorry. Still now. 
I think you were on mute, Anya, so we couldn't hear the sound. So maybe we can start from the beginning and play. Oh, yeah, again. I just want to make sure it's coming through the computer and not through my. Um, Got it. One moment. I'm so sorry about that. Um, let's see. Nick, do you maybe want to just jump in and and share this? Um, since I'm not sure what's going on with my. Are you able to or no? Sure, just one moment. Let me pull I'm that so up. sorry about this. Thank you very much. All right, let's get started. I have a thinker amongst you who justly charges that the most shocking reveal is not the death of them, but how quickly the wheels of the economic system ground to a halt. A system that has been vastly regarded as unstoppable, and imbibed with a godlike life of its own, beyond human imaginations. You have worshipped false gods. The Diamond Princess Cruise Liner releases a statement saying they will continue to work with the Japanese authorities. The principal opinion I wanted to express was a lack of adequate infection control inside the crew. The Japanese government also decides that the crew will not be quarantined. The crew members that we were able to speak to were expressing concern and frustration uh, over being forced to continue working. Wala ni isang taong makikita sa mga pasilyo ng cruise ship na Diamond Princess na nakadaong ngayon sa Yokohama, Japan. Kuha ito ng Pinoy crew na itatago natin sa pangalang Lester. Kahit naka-quarantine ang buong bako, tuloy pa rin ang kanilang pagsiservisyo. What would it cost to hire one of your smaller planes put all the Brits on board, no flight attendants, just packaged food, so the pilots, they would be exposed, I guess. Primarily from the Philippines, India, and Indonesia, the crew will be expected to work for at least 13 hours a day, going door to door, attending to the guests' needs. That you don't have any value uh, as a human being. Uh, you are just a number. It must not have been easy for them. Um to you know continue doing all this non-stop um, work while they themselves were you know under the same threat as we were that's what the cruise line industry is supposed to be about but since the outbreak of the coronavirus that image has been tarnished outbreaks of covid 19 claimed lives passengers were eventually allowed to go home but crew members many of the migrants from poorer countries like the philippines have all but been abandoned. What, after all, is fate playing but the cosmic gamble for those for whom life can be parceled out, bought, sold, traded? A seemingly perpetual state of indentures, in short, a fate determined by forces far beyond one's grasp and control, and instead always in a dynamic state of play. So that was a three minute clip of um, this video that we made um, called The Diamond Princesses Forever. Uh, we're going to make a link live for anybody who's curious to view the whole 10 minutes of it, because it's a lot. <laughs> it's actually quite a lot. Um, 
Yes. Uh, from there, I think I'm going to segue into a work that I want to show you. Um, if I can just share my screen and then James will come after me and then we can have a good discussion amongst everyone. I think that's the plan for today. Can you see this? Uh, yeah. So um, I'm actually going to show you a work called Maga Meets Marie, which I had here in Vienna last year, um, in March last year. And this work um, came right after the Capitol riots on January 6th. So, um, Bit of a traumatic event for me <laughs> and I'm sure for like a lot of us who are watching it and I wanted to segue into this because as this discussion is about art and healing um, this work kind of came from a place where I felt I needed to heal uh, and it, this was my way of sort of digesting um, what I had seen and kind of what I was hearing and uh, experiencing. I have to clarify, though, that I saw the riots uh, from Vienna, because I'm based in Vienna, Austria now. So I wasn't in the US watching this, I was watching from miles away. But I, I still felt something in myself break. Um, and that could have been because I, you know, um, I come from a really big uh, diasporic Filipino family. So a lot of my cousins grew up in the US. Um, I came to the US in 1999 on a green card um, and eventually became a citizen myself. But um, I've always had this ambivalent kind of relation with the US. Like it was always like, it had this dreamlike quality to it, right? Like I always um, kind of uh, saw the US in the shape of a balikbayan box. I think anybody who's Filipino American uh, knows what a balikbayan box is. It's kind of this huge nondescript cardboard box that your relatives from the US would ship over to the Philippines and it'd be filled with goodies. Like the US had a smell to me. It was like um, LA gear sneakers and Hershey's bars, right? That to me was the US. So um, watching the Capitol riots unfold uh, sort of, kind of um, really squashed this um, relationship I felt I had with the US and me. Like it, it, it made me question what democracy was. What was it really? Who was it for? Um, why were there so many people who felt so alienated from this, from this concept or felt like they couldn't participate in it or in a way felt this was their way of participating in this concept of democracy? And yeah, it just really felt like um, there a breaking point had been reached. So let me go through my slideshow because I'm talking too much without showing you anything. Um, so I decided to reclaim the words MAGA to begin with. So what could MAGA stand for? A lot of things. Uh, these were the banners that I came up with. Um, I'll quickly go through them because I have very limited time. You can see I also appropriated the QAnon <laughs> logo, um, as well as Marie Antoinette, because the, the Maga meets Marie reference is actually to Marie Antoinette and the French Revolution. Um, this show happened in Vienna, um, in the district where the Schönbrunn Castle is. That's where Marie Antoinette grew up. Um, so it was also a very fitting place to kind of juxtapose um, these two revolutions and see kind of uh, what would come out af uh, of this juxtaposition. Um, here's the GNA. That's the Proud Boys logo behind the G over there. Hi, Stephanie. I don't yes. think I'm seeing um, the, if you're scrolling through the images, I'm not, I'm not seeing the rest of them. Oh, no. I'm, I'm happy Sorry to pull it up. That. No Can worries you, at all. Yes, Nick, I'll, pull, I'll pull it up just a second. Thanks, Nick. I somehow knew that I was really like bad with technology today. <laughs> Thank you for letting me know. So if we can start with the MA uh, banners. 
So this is the MA banners um, I was talking about, and then we can scroll through the next. Um, you can see that the A has the QN on uh, logos uh, used as the kind of uh, background pattern. And here's the GNA um, and G having um, the Proud Boys logo on it in the back. Um, the central piece of this whole installation is actually the chandelier called the seance. Um, and this is where I felt uh, the French Revolution met with the capital riots. Um, it's, um, you can go on the next. It's all, uh, it all has these chicken feet candles on them, which I lit throughout the um, exhibition. Um, and we know that, well, in most rituals, the chicken foot is actually supposed to resemble a safe passing through into the next, into the spirit world. So I thought like to try to kind of have the spirits of the revolution meet and I kind of make sense of each other as this turmoil was also happening within me. Like this actually was the, central piece of the entire show. Um, and aside from that, I was also, yeah, so it's all black candle wax. Um, if we can go on to the next slide. I also took a lot from um, kind of the, the symbols and costumes that I saw in the Capitol riots as well. So I recreated some of them um, and we can go through them. Um, I tried to, uh, reappropriate the hat and kind of question what was it that we were making great again? <laughs> and the shaman headgear as well. Um, and the ubiquitous um, soldier's helmet. And I want, and the broom. And I wanted to end with this slide because this was actually my trigger for the entire installation, which had me thinking about uh, my relationship with the U.S. and immigrants' relations with the U.S. and what it meant to them to be part of it or not part of it. Um, if you go to the next slide, Nick. So this was one of the most popular photos of the Capitol riots. Um, it was this person was later identified as a Filipino, um, but it took Filipinos like a second to actually recognize that this person was Filipino. Um, which is interesting because there's nothing really in the outfit that's a giveaway, except for that broom, which is a ubiquitous <laughs> Filipino broom in every household. Um, so then, yeah, the hunt became easier, but this, quest, uh, this picture actually led me into my questions of what um, a relationship between immigrant and country could mean and how is it that you can have someone in a riot where it's obviously for someone who's not pro-immigrant rights. So yeah, I think I will end there. Um, I tried to make it fast. Sorry if I went over five minutes. James? Hi, sorry. Uh, Okay, yeah, so um, I'll share my screen also. What I was going to do is just kind of show uh, just a small, small selection of works that happened um, last couple of years from the beginning of the pandemic uh, till now. Um, let me just see this real quick. So the, the pandemic, when the pandemic started about a week before New York um, uh, shut down, uh, my younger brother uh, passed away. Uh, we believe it was like due to uh, COVID. Uh, it was like the week before um, the city shut down. So we had to kind of deal with um, his death and um, uh, with everything happening at that time and happening so quickly, uh, it was a lot to kind of process. Um, and then just like the logistics of trying to deal with that, with like a family uh, member passing away. Um, I mean, we had like issues of like, even like getting the body back to the funeral, to having the funeral. We couldn't like have an open uh, funeral. There was only like six people allowed uh, to be there. Just the, you know, the lockdown and the way that people were dealing with that, uh, with the pandemic was something at such a global scale. 
was something that was so like tremendous. Um, so these pieces had been um, done uh, around that time and kind of in uh, reaction to it. Uh, this is, uh, without you, there's less data. And it is, uh, it's like a algorithmically generated uh, single cloud hovering in the sky. So you have this kind of sphere that's kind of undulating. Um, and then the sphere kind of lowers in resolution uh, in the video array. So I was thinking about like kind of the experience of somebody and how much information they give to you. When you have that loss, then you have this kind of loss of information. Um, it's about like kind of thinking about keeping this kind of just evolving, um, yet temporary archives. Um, and then kind of like how people, like the relationship with people can make you experience the world uh, with more information or higher resolution. Um, let's see. This is uh, called I'll Stare at the Sun Till I See You Again. Uh, and again, it looks, so I've been interested in these kind of algorithmically generated pieces. So they're not video pieces or they're not like animations. They're just kind of uh, endlessly generated. Uh, at the bottom, like this is a, a lens flare. And then the lens flare, each kind of grid as you go up, I'm increasing the contrast and the brightness uh, just to get the kind of noise uh, in there. And so at the top, you have all these colors that weren't originally there. Uh, and this kind of information that wasn't there. Um, I'll stare at the sun until I see you again is kind of like, um, you know, you stare at the sun and it's painful. After a certain amount of time, maybe you go blind and then you'll see things in your mind. Um, so it's kind of like um, a tolerance. Um, so during the pandemic, then what, I, what happened with all this kind of happening and all this kind of change is uh, I moved from uh, New York and Brooklyn, where my studio was, and I moved to Manila, I moved back to Manila. Um, so I started to, I've, I've been here since uh, for over a year, about a year, uh, and I'm starting to produce some works there. Um, this is called Hey, I'm Walking Here. Um, I've been interested in like the kind of new environment that I'm in um, and kind of absorbing that and kind of processing that through the kind of technology and, and video works uh, that I've been doing. Uh, this is a piece that kind of focuses on the person's feet as they walk through Manila and they're kind of expressing uh, different emotions. Um, sometimes they're dragging on the floor or they're walking on air. Um, and I was interested in kind of the foot's connection to the environment and our physical connection to the environment. Uh, he's leaking, constantly leaking water uh, because uh, the Philippines is an archival archipelago, so it's, you have to cross through water to get here. When I first arrived in the Philippines, it was uh, at the height of one of the waves. So the sea was actually in um, lockdown, 6 p.m. curfew. You couldn't leave the other uh, areas of the city. You were kind of like locked into the area that you were. So uh, one of the video pieces we did was uh, I took a, a laser projector and I mounted it onto a, a car. And then we drove through the city with this animation of a, a dog. Uh, projecting it onto the physical environment of the city. So, I mean, this is kind of like how reality had become where, you know, we can only travel virtually. Um, and then uh, lastly is, um, this is a video installation that was done uh, for an exhibition at Silverlands Gallery here. It's called A New Day and New Night. And what it is, is this video is sped up, but it's, Every minute, I have this list of 26,000 cities on Earth, and I'm taking that database and, and updating it to what the sunrise time and the sunset time is for each of those cities. Every minute of the hour, or every minute, it will choose a city where it is currently, the sun is currently rising or setting. So it just kind of follows the sun as it travels around the Earth, uh, and then just reminding you that in every, that every minute, there's like a, a city where the sun is rising, or the city that's the sun is setting. So just kind of like creating these kind of new chapters of experience. Uh, and this is part of an exhibition called Share Location uh, that happened this last summer. Uh, share Location is this function in your cell phones uh, where you kind of digitally share where you are, uh, your GPS location. Uh, but now I'm kind of interested in sharing location and the idea of like sharing a physical space with other people and so like the arts community here and people that I talk to. 
and um, yeah, so that was was fun to kind of share some of the work that spanned those last couple of years. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much for all of your presentations and sharing your work with us today. Um, Suzanne and I would like to kick off with a couple of questions um, of our own, and then we'd like to open things up to the broader audience, who I'm sure is eager to ask all of you many questions. Um, I had a question to start, and it was really sparked for me by watching Stephanie share her work. Um, and it concerned the limits of healing in this pandemic moment. So I'm wondering if any of you, all of you, would like to speak to what you see through your work as the limits of healing um, in the pandemic and how your art or your art criticism engages with those limits. In other words, does it expose them? Does it challenge them? How does it do that? Um, and where are you getting with that right now? So I don't know who would like to, to jump in. I'm happy to say something very short. Um, and then I know we don't have too much time. Um, so I, th I think one of the things that I've been really struck by is the fact that, uh, and I think um, Guadalupe's work is really so uh, powerful in for, for exactly that reason, is that healing or even kind of this, this idea of care is very, um, uh, is is not accessible necessarily for everybody. So what, um, you might have a kind of abstract notion of what healing is or what, what can heal you. And that can be a very broad range of things, um, starting from, you know, access to care to even just access to information, um, as well as just access to mental space and um, space that allows you to, um, to, to process what's happening um, to you. Um, and I think that, that kind of... Um, shining a light on um, on this sort of um, disparate world of what um, what healing, how much healing is accessible um, to people and what that means, especially as you experience a pandemic because it means so many different things to different people as well. Um, I think in some sense has been uh, important for the Visualizing the Virus Project as well to, to showcase, um, not necessarily very well all the time because it's uh, it's, it's hard to kind of, you know, sort of quantify and, uh, um, but it comes through stories and it comes through um, artistic projects. It comes through actually just talking to people. Um, and so I think that's, um, yeah. That's great. Would anyone else like to jump in? <laughs> I think uh, what I've found myself really dealing with um, uh, through the pandemic is how to keep myself not angry, like even as I'm trying to process things through art making, like, because um, I feel like a lot of, of, of the things that are actually happening and the whole dispossession and the, the discarding of people and like access to healthcare or very simple things are actually like system made. You know they're so they're so huge and so beyond us and but you can see how arbitrarily placed they are like you know like if the pandemic has exposed anything it's how everything is really like made up in a way <laughs> and this this fuels such a huge frustration in me and I've I've let all of that out through art hopefully but it it is it does it confronts you constantly with how to then deal with this rage and this anger and and how can you actually turn it into something that is not debilitating but um, that can create another sort of energy that can lead to something that are yeah so I'm trying to think in terms of world making and futures and putting something out into the world that you know can kind of picture a better place I know that sounds a bit naive but it's kind of kept me going. Well, we need it right now. <laughs> um, Guadalupe, your work seems to speak directly to that notion. Do you, do you want to follow up on that? Yeah. Um, well, I, I think the, it's really important for us as individuals to learn how to care for ourselves. Everyone's different. Uh, so I think it starts there. 
um, you know, just like my, it, for me, it starts with my daily meditations that I have, my, my daily rituals that, that I perform in the house. Uh, I'm, I'm super busy right now with, with going in so many different directions, but I, I don't really come home. Um, I, I don't, I don't deplete myself in other words, um, because of how I take care of myself. I really think as, as society is suffering right now, um, you know, because of our diet and I'm not talking about just how, how we eat it's in particular, yeah, I'm definitely talking about that. But in addition to that is. Our diet also consists of what we read, what we watch on, you know, like what movies we watch, what we're exposed to, like it all affects like your, your eyes, your, what you listen to, what, what you see, like it's all part of the same diet. It's like whatever is entering into your body, right? Whether it's food, whether it's alcohol, whether it's, it's something that you're reading or listening to, it's, it's, it can also, it could be very healing, but it could also work in reverse. It can corrupt you. Um, so that self-care is, is central. And before you can go and help the world, like you really need to kind of do that inner work yourself. Maybe following that, um, it takes in a, a little bit different direction, but Guadalupe, I was struck by your kind of idea that there's like a transitive function or that um, these are healing instruments or that you're in some ways, it's a kind of didactic or pedagogical role where you're not doing the work for others, but you're kind of showing them how to do the work for themselves. And that made me think a lot though about the platforms and the kind of institutional support and kind of where this work can happen both kind of on the scale of systems, but also really interpersonally, I was struck by the, you know, I know a lot of your work prior to the pandemic, of course, was taking place or even through it in closed rooms and really intimate bodily relation to others. And then with Socrates, of course, like outside and there are ways that this can function. Um, but I was just wondering if you could kind of talk more about how, um, how the kind of reshaping of questions of both institution, but also kind of proximity to other bodies and what kinds of institution or what kind of support systems need to be there for this work to happen, how the pandemic has changed those questions for you. Yeah, no, so like I, you know, I, I work with institutions. I currently have a show at MoMA, one's opening up at the Brooklyn Museum in, in April. Um, I'm very limited to what I can do there with, with the undocumented community, right? The undocument, undocumented community will not feel safe going into this, into this institutional space. Right. So what I do is like I, where's the undocumented community? They're they're in the church, right? I'm not a religious person. I'm a highly spiritual person, and I respect the pastor. He's one of my best friends now, um, and I go do my work there, right? So it, it's unfortunately that's how it is right now. Um, the cancer community, it, you know, where it also depends. The pandemic is very limiting, right? Um, the you know, so it's like um. But I also do a lot of private work in my studio. My studio is turned into like a private clinic or during the pandemic. I have these sculptures there that are completely active. Like I'm activating them all the time. Like two or three times a week, people are coming to my studio at the end of my shift of, of like working in there. They come in there and they do a ceremony, private ceremonies. Um, so there's a lot of limitations with what the government can offer me, what institutions can offer, and what the church can offer, right? Because there's there's a lot of you know history there that's very corrupted the church um so like I, I have this grand vision like I, I i teach i tell my students that they need to dream big and i'm dreaming big as well uh what i've done this is just the beginning uh, i envision creating these kind of community centers that are temples uh that will be run by artists run by healers uh free of this uh, government free of of institution and free of, of the church, right? So I, I, I'm, that's my vision. And there will be like these, I'm gonna make some sculptures for those spaces um, for them to be activated constantly. So like that, that is, I haven't found that place yet. And I'm kind of have my foot in, in every, you know, just like in every stone right now until I kind of create my own. But I feel like I do need to create my own. I want to, if I could, um read a comment that was just posted to the chat from one of our attendees about um, the notion, the act of healing. 
Um, it's from Andrew Woolbright, who writes, I love that art allows for acts of healing to be gestures and suggestions, a space for trying things and acknowledging that everyone heals differently. But that isn't a stopping point. It's a polyphonic space for attempting. Mm. I don't know if that resonates with any of you, James, if you would like to jump into the fray. Yeah, I think, well, you know, I think that, uh, you know, the, the pandemic has kind of shifted everything and caused people to try to re-understand or reevaluate things. Uh, and so people are going towards the, you know, spirituality or um, alternative medicines and, and, you know, alternative ways of, of viewing um, reality. I think, like, from my standpoint, I, I try to understand, like, information and also, like, kind of technology systems and how that, that's kind of, like, shifted our viewpoint, too. Uh, so I think there's kind of, um, there's parallels. Uh, uh, with that in terms of trying to understand like how, um, yeah, how technology kind of affects us and also like the, uh, our daily view on things. Um, yeah, for me, it's about understanding and just trying to understand like how things, how things are now. I also wanted to ask, all of you who are creating work, whether it be artwork or art criticism broadly defined, um, when you're making work that responds so directly and specifically to a moment in time, and it's the moment we're in right now, um, what does that mean for the future of the work? And I wanna point to Shreya on this. I'm wondering if you can talk about what you see as the, the life cycle of visualizing the virus. Um, how long do you expect to be doing this work? Um, when do you know that you're done? What comes next? What would be your after? Yeah, this is a really good question because I think this is something that I've been really aware of from the beginning. And, uh, and it's also very related to the question of why, why do this um, as well? Because um, in a sense, I mean, I, I'll get to your point about like the logistics of how long it will run. Not that I know the answer, but anyway. Um, but just the, the fact that um, like thinking about the present also historically and um, I'm partly because I'm uh, like, that's my background. Um, and connecting sort of this pandemic to other um, sort of past pandemics, but also just other experiences of inequality and systemic problems, I think has been really kind of key and it's changed. Like it's changed so much from what I was thinking in December, 2020 to what I'm thinking now and not just what I'm thinking so much as, you know, kind of what we're all collectively thinking. Um, and um, so I think that, that's been quite like it's been helpful and if you look at the, the website as well it's very like growy and um organic is not the word i want to use but you know it, it's there's space and room to grow like that that's the idea is that like the the themed clusters all grow it's sort of you we're adding to, to it every day no that's not true um as as often as we can um and so in a sense the the this idea that we're kind of um collecting the moment and reflecting on the moment as we we go forward i think is quite interesting because uh even like thinking about 2020 seems like we have much more distance from it and in fact we were talking the other day within the team that um the kinds of things that we're um getting now or even in conversations and interviews is really different because we have a little bit like we still there's so many things we still don't know um, but we we have some experience, um, and so so I think time is really quite um, key in some sense um, to to how we think about yeah the project, and and in terms of practical when I started out, um, we, well, we had thought it it would be a two year sort of project, not thinking that the pandemic itself would be maybe longer than that. Um, 
And so, and I think the idea very much had been to create something, to start creating something and let, let people continue to create it in a sense as, as, in, as in when or as in how they want to. Um, that's easier said than done. Like it's not so, it doesn't always work the way you kind of plan it. And, uh, you know, you kind of need to direct things a certain way. Funding and how, how things are funded is also, and this kind of question of institution, uh, institution how, in, how institutional do you want something to be? Because that also limits the kinds of things that you can um, have on there. Um, so I think I've been dealing, well, all of us have been dealing with questions such as this. And so I don't have a clear answer to how long we will be collecting, but I think I'm hoping that there will be, um, you know, it'll just feel like, yeah, that's it, we're, we're done. You know, this is what looks like it's being, it's contained. And, and I, the other thing is to say that the, the idea of making things open access as well, and to have in, uh, inviting people to, to reflect on what did they do um, and have it available uh, for people to see is, is really important. And so the idea that is that it, it, it goes into um, a couple of different archives. The Ivy Plus archive is one of them. Um, and um, it, it'll just be available. Of course, like the longevity of digital things is a different story altogether, but yeah. You know, may I jump in there? Because it makes me think, you know, like Stephanie and Jane, with your video, um, I was thinking so much about the kind of punctual, the response, which was so, to an event that seems so punctual, that's had this duration, so as you're saying, like, who would have thought two years later, and we're still so much in it, and these ideas that it's somehow becoming endemic keep getting kind of kicked down the road further and further. Um, but what you're saying makes me think, too, about this question of the, you know, the relation or the interval or space or however, whatever kind of language we'd want to put on it between these emergent events or social media, like with the diamond princess, the kind of culling of social media and these um, newscast reports that are kind of eminent to that situation. But then the, the way that in some ways the circulation of these works kind of survives these moments and frames them so differently after, but it made me think too about from this kind of question of the archive or history, you know, at what point for this moment, you know, are all these things which are really so ephemeral, like how do we as historians kind of grapple with it, not kind of as it's emerging and making something, but also kind of holding on to it. Because if it weren't for, I mean, I'm sure these TikTok accounts still exist, or you know, some of the sources that you went to for the Diamond Princess, of course, you, they, they could be scraped, you could still you, you could still mine some of this, but it just made me think about the kind of ephemerality of so much that is actually happening in relation to this moment as it's unfolded. And how do we kind of hang on to it? How do we, um, Isri, and, and I'm sorry, this is so kind of constellated, but just thinking of your point about how your work is so engaged with kind of past pandemics and looking ahead to our session in March where we're gonna be um, talking with various academics and scholars who are looking at the kind of relation between art and health, again, very broadly conceived at other historical moments and kind of thinking about what kinds of documentation or what kinds of sources exist or remain extant to kind of even write those histories that can then have some purchase on the present, um, but what a different kind of media environment we exist in. Um, and what the relation of art is to not only processing it kind of in its most immediate um, kind of instance, but also how it, how it holds it or how it actually holds some space for the possibility of history emerging at some, some later point. It, Maybe that was more a series of thoughts than a question. No, but we, <laughs> it was spot on and I, I completely agree, yes. I mean, we weren't thinking about it as we were making the, the video at that time, but it can be looked at as an archive too and how it does also create this kind of um, its own world. Like um, if anybody's curious about the video, at one point we also referenced the Titanic and how this is another um, event of a cruise ship where it was kind of very obvious who was given priority. 
in this setting. So um, yeah, so there is this kind of um, liminal space that's kind of being created, but as well like very uh, specific historic points that are kind of used to map the entire setting of the thing. And very different historical actors and are often given kind of protagonist roles in the narration of events, um, at least in academic history and the way it's operated in the US. Yeah. yeah, and a lot of that also has to do with like the access to technology too, and you know, people who can contribute into, you know, into the digital space. I remember when we did this video, uh, we originally had uh, shown it with Vera List Center, and uh, we had uh, a class from Cebu in the Philippines um, call in and then act as OFWs and, and overseas workers at the end of the video. And so we had prepared like a performance, this online performance piece. And, um, you know, a lot of these students, when we were doing the, the run throughs, um, you know, they're, they're taking their online classes on their cell phones. You know, they don't even have like laptops and they have to, you know, when the world shuts down and everyone's forced to use uh, laptops and technologies and Zooms, you know, a lot of people don't even have access to that or can do that, you know, and so we're, you know, they're left behind. Tanya, would you like to jump in at this point? Sure, yeah. I, I know our publisher and artistic director, Fong Bui, would love to ask a question uh, to our panelists. So, Fong, I'd love to turn to you. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, James. Thank you, Guadalupe and Sierra and everyone here, really. Um, I, I've been thinking a great deal about this similar topic at the rail also, because as soon as former President Trump, who appeared on television, you all remember Monday, March 16, 2020. And then he announced the 15 day quarantine. I'm sure he wasn't even aware where that were originated from Venice and when and whatnot. <laughs> uh, but he had the, um, the arrogance to deploy that term that we all hated, social distancing, you know? So that's a very uh, manipulative term. It's saying that you weirdo, autistic, bohemian, intellectual, gay, lesbian, immigrant workers and whatnot in between the marginal people. <laughs> Don't get together, please stay separate. Don't get together because the way that thing did get together, the old community get together in the late 60s was a disaster. You know, you it began with the civil rights movement 1960 by the mid 60, it born the protest anti the Vietnam war. And then grew out of it is the woman liberation movement. So the tree coincide was so powerful, so energetic. Images were printed over the newspaper. It was the first time the Vietnam War was the, the war on television. You can even put it that way, you know? So the idea is how they mediate, control all of that energy. It's very interesting. Um, my, my interest in this immediately is that we launched the social environment lunchtime, a platform that you are now uh, sharing with us in this very topic, is that we know that we need to take all of our interest in the art and humanities away from the, from the academic setting. Ac academy has been so insularly kept for so long. I would even argue since the war in Vietnam ended in 1975. All of my so-called mentor and people who I admire so much, you know, uh, have gone to the academy and they never came out. They once was public in the lecture. Um, so this, this topic is important, but I'm asking you also, because we do have in past history where humanity have experienced incredible, whether natural pandemic like Black Death, or man-made disaster in America, for example, that would be the Great Depression. And we know that is the art of humanity that heal all of it, all those two instances I just named, because when you think about Black Death, 
it wiped out 60% of even just Florentine Republic alone, half a population. Um, and so many artists were killed, were victims. I mean, we forgot that even you take uh, like Masaccio as an example, the Brancacci Chapel, only a few weeks or so after having completed that amazing fresco that moved us every time we see, experience it, you know? He was barely 26 years old. The whole entire Giotto workshop was wiped out and many others. You can imagine that, you know, Lorenzetti brother in Siena was also fell into victimhood, but it didn't take the life of Donatello, Bruno Leschi and others. You can imagine how they revive and encourage through the wise people, whether it's Petrarca or Boccaccio or Lorenzo Valla, whoever, you know, Bracaccioni and uh, the wise people uh, were sent to Greece to translate all the sacred texts of the arts and humanity. And that's how Renaissance was began in building in Florence. You know, Renaissance, we also tend to forget, I mean, rebirth, remember? So it was incredible healing effort. And the same for the Federal Project One, part of the WPA. Uh, where poets, writer, artists were sent to work in public places, mediating with the public, especially working class America. You know, when I just the other night uh, browsing through the great show, the, the Family of Men, I think it was 1951 at MoMA, uh, is the most popular show ever amount, amounted at MoMA throughout its history. And when I look at through faces of Walker Evan or whoever else, Dorothy Land, you know, of those incredible poor working class American, they were taken with certain dignity. They were being taken seriously, you know? Um, I just don't know how to describe where we are now. I'm happy that we get together and talk about uh, this very issue, knowing that the cheap virtues of art is that it has exceptional power uh, to unify mankind. We know that you don't need to be a Buddhist to appreciate Christian art. Uh, you don't need to be, and vice versa, you know? Uh, we have traveled the world and we have experienced that similar elevation uh, of being touched by works of art. But so I, I, my question is that um, as the world getting more complex, more large in its incredible immersive overlay with history, with ambition from different places, particularly now, um, the our thinking here is so incredibly insular, is so incredibly fragmented. And you know that's not how, how the art humanity, people like us don't think that way. And my, my question to you, it is that what role can we do? What else can we do besides doing our work, which is amazing because we think, we never think small as a created being. We think, we tend to think very large. We absorb every possible creative thinking that excite us to create a certain kind of created flow, so to speak, that resemble a certain vitality of life. Because the writing, the art making, even talking like this, it had to resemble that vitality. I just reread, for example, <laughs> um, War Whitman Democratic Vista. This have no structure whatsoever. It's chaotic. <laughs> Read it three times, you guys. But what is so ecstatic about it is that it has amazing emotional energy. It's incredible and it's so generous, you know? Um, it has what he referred as cosmic optimism and energy. And I was wondering, you know, what can we do in the art humanities now, um, getting together like the way we are now, it's terrific because we are using technology for the opposite reason that demagogy people are good at. 
which is separate people, intensifying fear, you know? And they use speed better than we do. We are using slowness of culture. We do it every day. So that's terrific energy because we have to match those people after two for power. When people are absorbed with power, they don't go to sleep. And we know that Mussolini never goes to sleep. Stalin never goes to sleep. <laughs> Hitler never goes to sleep. And they know they have one thing in common. They don't like people like us. So I'm just questioning, bring up this collective question. How can we bring even greater among our community together? Even in technological form like this, we are very grateful to all of you guys because, and the grateful to our even creative invention because we're able to bring great warmth to this cold form, which is technology. We are able to do the opposite of social distancing. We are amplifying social intimacy. That's where we are now. Um, so my question to each of you guys is that, because I know some of you teach, you know, how can we bring this to the students? How can we make this more, more inviting as part of the curricula, maybe? Can, it, can, can we collaborate with various respective institutions somehow? Because as you all talking, I'm wondering whether some of your students are invited to this forum. And if not, why can't, why can't they? Why not? So why don't we start with uh, the great Suzanne Hudson, <laughs> my old friend. <laughs> Hi, Fang. Well, I'll be quick because I'm, I'm watching the time um, tick away and I want to make space for others too. But I mean, I think the, the answer for my work anyhow is to rethink what a history of art making looks like that is not only the property of professional artists or that doesn't only get made in spaces that are um, that have the intention of object production, but rather change the focus to what the making does for the maker and to think about a history that it's not biography exactly, although I think that needs to be rethought fundamentally too, but a history of the uses of art making and the kind of social possibilities, the emergent politics, and they weren't all benevolent and they didn't always arrive at what was a kind of imagined aspiration. But I'm really interested in the kind of history of the ideas around why art making as a kind of fundamental human activity mattered in different times and places and what people imagined that work could do. Um, and I think that has a lot to teach us kind of as case studies, but I think a reorientation of the field of art history away from kind of master works or a history of objects that students are kind of internalizing as a kind of, you know, it's not even about a canon expansion, but it's just about a reorientation away from materiality to the relations that are embedded or imbricated within, within those objects. I think that for me is a kind of um, horizon that I'm, I'm working towards. Terrific. Thank you, Suzanne. What, yeah. about, what about you, Tanya? And we can just, if anyone- Suzanne, Suzanne put that so beautifully, but I, I will say that teaching at Colby College, a small liberal arts college in Maine, as you can see, <laughs> we're at Maine. Um, everything I do in my research is filters back into my teaching and vice versa. And um, I think, you know, I've, I've used Shreya's website um, as a teaching tool. Um, Shreya, I don't know if you wanna comment on how, the, about the multiple audiences of your work. Um, but, you know, I think that this platform is very much the kind of platform that we need as instructors um, to bring our students into this larger community um, and also to expand our own minds, right? They ask beautiful questions that challenge us every single day. Um, so my students will be coming to the rest of the series. We just started our spring semester yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> they haven't geared up yet, but I'll be teaching a course on Fridays on art, medicine, and race, and they will very much 
be in attendance moving forward. Um, Shri, I don't know if you want to talk about sort of the, the teaching tool that you've created. Yeah, I mean, we're actually still working on how we can um, like really um, think about pedagogy and what to do with it. Um, but as uh, Tanya said, and thank you, Tanya, for, for using uh, the project in your class, uh, quite a lot of um, colleagues have reached out to say that they are doing the same. And, uh, and increasingly, we're trying to like make it easier to do that as well, uh, I think. And just as Suzanne said, um, uh, it's very much really about that relation, relationality and uh, the, um, visualizing the virus, especially like you can see that it really like visually makes those relations. Um, but and and I think for me, it has also been not just about that, but but to think of uh, visualizing and artworks uh, in a certain way and also think about how we see and what we see, like to, to really also question um, the way in which like what we see makes a difference uh, and how we see it is also political and things like that. Um, and so to ask those questions and make those, you know, sort of spaces for, of conversation. And I think the other thing that I'm really hoping that um, this can do is to open spaces like this up, not just to arts and humanities students, but to, but to students from a very different, like broad. Um, broad public. Yeah, broad, yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's our aims here, definitely. That's why we do it free. And if you notice the rail, we have the seven arts in it, as well as political commentary. So we have what I call readership spill over. So mm -hmm. we have all, the, all different kind of viewer. And we'll, we'll do it for the purpose of the archives. So we're doing it on, so put on YouTube. So it have different live, also free. So, uh, so thank you. No, I'm. I'm getting a little bit better uh, in tune with all of this immersive thinking of, of that you have brought in, all brought to this uh, NSE. I'm I'm thrilled, so I'm I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Fong, um, and thank you all for this wonderful panel uh, today. This has been so lovely. Um, I wish we had more time to to continue talking, but right now we're going to turn uh, to a poetry reading. Um, we have a tradition of ending these community events um, with poetry, and I'm thrilled to welcome our poet Tess Taylor to the stage. Uh, Tess Taylor is the author of five collections of poetry. In spring of 2020, she published two books of poems, Last West, part of Dorothea Lang, Words and Pictures at the Museum of Modern Art, and Rift Zone from Red Hen Press. Uh, Taylor has served as on-air poetry reviewer for NPR's All Things Considered for over a decade, and she's currently on the faculty of Ashland University's Low Res MFA Creative Writing Program. So please, Tess, close us out. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for this wonderful conversation. I'm so honored and glad to be part of it. I wanted to share an article I did last year for Harper's Magazine about the role of art in cultural repair in Northern Ireland, which is really about after 30 years of bombing each other, a country decides that they have to live together again and what they do is invest in art. And what does that mean for us? What can we learn from that? So um, I'm just gonna put that in the chat. Um, and that sort of catalyzed me into some of this conversation about art and healing and art and medicine um, and some of the work that's amazing work that's being done here, but also the need that we amplify um, our sense and calling of what we're doing um, with each other and for each other and for communities. Um, what an amazing thing to be able to be in dialogue with such fabulous artists and thinkers. I'm gonna read four poems. Uh, three of them are new actually from the pandemic time. Poem for heartbreak. On a morning of sorrow, I soak the beans. In grief, wash the kale's particulate dirt. Smooth down purple veins in the collard. In our basin, glittering earth, dirt the slow grandchild of river and mountain. There are horrors to take in today, but before I do, I peel sweet potatoes. 
I am making a meal for the journey. We will hold ourselves up on this coming day. Each potato still a gift of the earth. I fondle their silence, their musk underground hardness, their cold steadies my hands. Again and again, I hear my knife heave. They open and open against the wood board. This poem is for, um, for, um, for trying to get over being ill. Um, and it's called Chrysalis Time. In the cold months, because I had been ill and hoped to heal, and because I was still in pain, I'd go visit Marie a mile away on my orange bicycle and disrobe in her pink room with velvet chairs and potted ivy. Under her enormous framed prints of three-legged phoenix, flaming tiger, turquoise dragon, I lay down admired the phoenix's three-toed chicken feet. I'd let Marie put her needles in me and leave the sound of water running. I hovered somewhere between sleep and prayer. My spirit did long, difficult algebra in the dark. At times, my breath snagged in its bone cage, but somehow, bit by bit, my shoulders would unclench, and lo, in my belly, I'd discover a dim but steady light. This is my chrysalis time, I said one day. I heard myself tell myself and then Marie. I'd imagine the innards of a chrysalis, all poopy and proteins breaking down, amino to amino, loosening in a gooey, viscous soup, each building block a twisted molecule transforming, waste shifting, and other cells carrying it away. I thought of molting chickens, snakes in their pearlescent skins, the raw gleam of scar or new beginning. Later, biking home in early dark, feeling each thigh's sharp push uphill, air entering me cold and leaving warmer, I felt that I could carry this life longer, if only to admire the ginkgo's chartreuse flame. I was waiting, even if I wasn't sure that I could name what I was waiting for, what the still faint tendrils were becoming. I think one of the things that's important to me about poems is that they earth us into our breath and into our bodies. And when we read them, when we read someone else's poems, we actually share their breath a little bit. We, we make a record of our own breath and then we actually can share the breath of Rumi, who one of the people in this audience has translated beautifully, but we can share the breath of someone somewhere else in the world, somewhere else in time. Um, and then we're reminded of ourselves as living beings. So it's been funny in this pandemic to share breath in this very virtual way in a time when it's been so difficult to share it in an intimate way. There doesn't need to be a poem for this sadness. Simply to breathe next to the stream that slips into the gutter near your house would be enough. To see nearby in the graveyard, the brown and yellow millipede bury itself below one granite stone, joining in the work of making soil. The faithful oxygen still turns the copper headstone green, oxidizing to patina despite all. By luck, your own alveoli still red in blood, your cells sift the elements we call the air. This inner barter goes on invisibly, even if you can't remember how, even if it seems that pain too is a volatile molecule that grief attaches unpredictably to things. Yes, and the late sun rims a cloud. Watch that cloud. Inhale, exhale. Again, it's an honor to be here and we are doing good work together by sharing art, by curating conversation, by bearing witness to art.
People who participate in arts or um, activities are more likely to graduate from high school, more likely to vote, more likely to be a leader in their community, and more likely to have a friend across racial lines. You can just take that with you, knowing that you, you probably know that already somehow, but it's actually like factually true. You're building something good. We are all building something good. Song with wild plum and thorn. And I'll just finish with this and we can go off into our days in our various time zones all across the world. Song with wild plum and thorn. The morning is cold and the world is hard, but even in fog, it is still midsummer. The kids need to play and the grocery budget ticks towards nothing the way the world tips towards doomsday. The walls in my chest will not let me breathe and all the screens flicker and still answer nothing. So I take the children down to the bike path with buckets and a few blessed hours to wander a corridor with weedy fruit, blackberry, wild plum, all overhung, we leaners or gleaners, half acrobatic, lost among boughs, alone till I notice others stopping with buckets or tiffins in many languages along these tracks, picking the weeds we still hold in common as dry heat builds and fog thins. In common, in common, the thought feels strangely radical, crumb or bloom beyond loneliness. And then for a while, I feel entirely animal, little forager hungry for fruit, black sparkle, pale pit and thorn, weeds binding some world together. A word appears in my mind, hold fast, hold fast, sprout, raw volunteer. For a while, it is hand to mouth and to bucket. Breathing, still here, still here. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tess, uh, for that beautiful and fitting reading. And thank you, Shreya, James, Guadalupe, Stephanie, Suzanne, and Tanya for being here today. We'd like to thank our friends at Colby Center for the Arts and Humanities and USC Dornside College of Letters, Arts, and Sciences for making this event possible today. And we encourage everyone to view our archives of these conversations that's on our YouTube channel where we'll be uploading this shortly. And you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Harun Mirza and Charlotte Kent on the event of his exhibition for a Dyson Sphere at Lisan Gallery, which will be concluded with a poetry reading by Paige Murphy. And you can now uh, turn on your microphones and say thank you and goodbye. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all so Thank much. You so Thank you. Much. Thank you. Thank you. Such Thank a brilliant you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, James. Thank you all. Thank you, great. everyone. Thank you. This is amazing. Thank you, Tanya. Thank, Thank you, Susan. You. Thank you, Thank you. Amazing. James. Thank you. Thank you, Tess. Thank you, Stephanie. Tess, for the beautiful. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you, Suzanne. You're the best. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. <laughs> Thank you for hosting us. Oh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Beautiful for the next install installment. This is terrific. Hey Tom. Hi. Hey. Yeah, <laughs> oh, this is important. Keep up the good work, you guys. We are very excited because finger cross, I think their potential sponsorship for this whole NSC for the next two years. So we yeah. finger cross till it happen. Call me dad. <laughs> We'll bring together and it's just growing, growing. It's, this is our, how many number episode we've done, Nikki? 300. No, more than that. It's 400. 487th. Yes. Wow. Oh. Yeah. So it's so great to mm -hmm. hear and then have poems, restore the end, nurture the soul. Yeah. What, what do we want? What else do we want? Art, <laughs> friendship, what else? Drinks. Well, what else? <laughs> <laughs> drinks. <laughs> all right. Thank you all. Bye. Bye, bye. Thank you so much for having thank us. You, bye. Bye. Thank you all. Good night. Take bye. care. Be safe. Good night, James. Sleep well. <laughs>
Bye, Michelle. Ciao. Bye. Bye.